welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, the tough-talking, advice-giving show by the not-really-mean, mean lady, Susan J. Elliott. Okay, so when you are dealing with a personality disordered person or the extremely dysfunctional, after the breakup, what you need to do is you need to break out of the dance. It means you need to not do what you are used to doing, even if it's to say nothing. That is why my mediation last week was so successful, even though I wasn't in the room. I was able to coach my clients, say nothing. And then she was able to figure out where he was going, what his points were. She came out to me and the responses that I gave her were nothing that she was going to come up with. It was a combination of me being a lawyer, but the most helpful thing about me coaching someone, whether it's as a therapist or as a lawyer, is that I've been there. And The American Bar Association says your divorce coach should have more experience than just having been through a divorce. But I can tell you that having been through a divorce, although it wouldn't qualify me to do what I do, many times it's what I fall back on. And I did a podcast recently about how I changed the dance with the banana head showing up in court in a little pink dress. And he was like, who the hell is that? So when you're dealing with somebody, you have to say something different. You have to do something different. And what happens, and I know that this was my experience when I first started doing this, not just in court, but in setting boundaries with the personality disorder, I didn't know what the words were. I had to have these conversations with my ex. He would be belligerent. He would say all the crazy things that he always said. He would gaslight me. He would tell me how terrible I was, yada, yada, yada. The only thing I knew how to do was to deny and defend. That's what I knew how to do because that's what I'd done for years. So I would say nothing, which is what my therapist said. She said, know what you think, know what you feel. And when you don't know what you think or feel, say and do nothing. So I tell my clients that all the time. When your brain is saying one thing and your heart is saying another thing and your therapist's words in your head or my words in your head or somebody's words in your head, healthy words in your head are saying another thing, but your old dance is saying something else, do nothing, do absolutely nothing, say absolutely nothing. So when you do that, you throw them out of line. They don't know what to do and they will badger you and they will try to up the ante. They will do something to get you to play. Don't play. They'll call you names or accuse you of things you didn't do. And it is very, 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 very tempting to go, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't. The minute those words start coming out of your mouth, you're in trouble. You've lost. Forget it. Only way to win is not to play the game. Hello, hello, hello. The only way to win is not to play the game. Whenever you are tempted to say something and the banana head is accusing you of all kinds of crazy crap, say nothing. Say the only way to win is not to play the game. The only way to win is not to play the game. The only way to win is not to play the game. And when you don't dance the way you've always danced, they don't know what to do. It throws them off completely. What happened in mediation last week was she threw him off completely and he started spinning out of control. And the mediator got to the point where, what's wrong with you? Saying it directly to Banana Head. And he had a friend with him. And when we were out in the hallway, the banana head was giving me all kinds of dirty looks. I think he had a clue what was going on. And this has happened to me a million times where suddenly the partner or the ex-partner gets a clue that the problem is me. And I'm the one that's thrown a monkey wrench into the circus. I am going to change the entire way we're doing things. And he was getting a clue and he's giving me daggers the whole time. Even when everybody went back into court, he's giving me daggers. So I took the heat off of her and I kept telling her, don't worry about the looks that he's giving me. You just concentrate on you. 
I am more than happy to be the fall guy here because I can handle Mr. Banana Head and his stupid daggers. I don't give a crap what he thinks, what he says, what he's doing. And I smiled at him. I said, how oh, hi. I waved at him a little bit across the courtroom a couple of times when I would catch him looking at me, which was totally different. When I was in court with my former friend's sociopathic ex, I was I had my hand on my cheek and I had my middle finger up because I knew that he kept looking at me and that stopped it right in the tracks. But that was more of a personal situation. This was a professional situation. So I would just give him a little wave and a smile when I saw him looking at me. So when you are with the personality disorder, or even the extremely dysfunctional, we don't have to label everybody personality disordered, but it works very, very well with somebody who has been gaslighting you. You have to change the steps of the dance. You have to do it. Now, one of the things that somebody recently said in the Facebook group was that her eyes were open when she went to Getting Back Out There, which for the hundred millionth time is not a dating book. And she saw the dysfunctional communication methods. And it talks about all of the different things that people do. And she said she had no idea. And one of the things that I said to her was, I've asked for reviews on the Facebook group. You don't have to finish the entire Getting Back Out There book. She looked at a couple of different sections of it, which are very helpful to her, the standards and compatibility, the early relationship, the healthy communication, and all those things she said she learned things that she never, ever heard before. And if you have something like that that's helpful, you can go on Amazon, you could go on Barnes & Nobles, you can go on Goodreads, you could go wherever, and you can write that. You could say, wow, I never knew this, and this book talks about this, this, and this. It wasn't even talking about dating. All the things that she found very helpful was about relationships. She's still getting over her breakup. She's still working through everything, but she didn't know that these things were dysfunctional. And now she's going to go back and do her relationship inventory again. Because now she's got more negative stuff to talk about because she didn't realize that a lot of these communication methods are wrong and not okay. So I said, getting past your breakup doesn't need more reviews. If you want to give it one, that's lovely. Thank you very much. But a lot of people in this world, especially those that are competing against getting past your breakup, they pay for reviews and where they have family and friends do what's called review stuffing, where they stuff place or another with reviews. When I was doing soaping and making scrubs and all those other things, which I absolutely love doing and I haven't done it in a while, and that's a whole other story, people came to us all the time. When you're in a big group like that and you are one of these communities, they would say, oh, try this ingredient, try that ingredient. We'll give it to you free. And a lot of it is very expensive ingredients that they would give you. We'll give it to you for free in exchange for a review. First, I say a review. So I did one of these because as an author, I wanted to know how these paid reviews were working. And as a lawyer, I didn't want to say anything that could possibly be actionable where somebody could come and charge me with business defamation or whatever it is. So I wanted to know exactly what the story was. And what happened was I put on sort of a neutral review. And you have to send the place that sent you the free thing a review. And he wrote me back and he said something to the effect of, this was like the third review. Every time you give them a review, they'll send you another product. And then you review that product and that product and that product and that product. So I was getting a good feel of what this was like. So on the third product, I gave a very, very short neutral review. And he basically reamed me out, said, you're not going to get free products for a review like this. And it really didn't say what was helpful about it. You need to really amp it up and things like that. And I was like, aha, uh -huh, this is how it happens. And I've noticed that this practice has become more and more and more prevalent over the past five to 10 years. And people are really starting to distrust reviews because they're thinking, oh, the positive reviews are just paid product reviews. We all need honest reviews. We really do. We need honest reviews. If you've read Getting Back Out There, even if you've only read a chapter or two, please review it and say what you think about it. You can always go and edit it later. I edit my reviews all the time when I've had a product for a while. I have 
update your review when you finish the book. You could say, well, I read the first three chapters and they were really great and I loved it, but now they suck, so I'm taking away all the stars. I mean, you don't have to finish the book or use it for dating in order to do a review on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, Goodread, wherever it is. You can always update it later on. We all need honest reviews. And I'm not saying this just about my products, but I pass on all of the discounts. A review will result in another sale. A good review will result in another sale. Another sale will result in royalty. The royalty will result in me lowering the prices of seminars, of workshops, of boot camps. We'll also be able to give scholarships to the domestic violence fund. And I also will be able to give books to domestic violence shelters. So you writing something cost you absolutely nothing will come back and help other people. I don't understand why people have such a difficult time with this. If you go on to YouTube, if you go on to our YouTube channel, please like the videos, just go through them and like them. It's not going to take a lot of time. It's not going to cost you anything. Go on the workbooks, Facebook page and like it. Go on my author page and like it. Go on the Getting Past Your Breakup Facebook page and like it. Go on the podcast and give it a review. You could go on Stitch, you could go on SoundCloud, you could go on other things. You don't have to stay on one platform that you listen to. I know Google Play doesn't have a review mechanism. If you listen on Google Play, which most people listen on Google Play, please go on anywhere and just review it. Give it stars, do whatever, but please help it out. You want to help out other people, other people out there hurting. I could be doing so many other things, making so much more money than this, but I care about people. And what I ask is that when you're getting emotionally healthy, you care about people as well. And part of the way that you can express that is to lead them to these very free resources that I have available. And the way you do that is you raise the visibility and how you do that is by reviews and stars and likes. Please do that. And when I go to talk to agents, when I go to talk to publishers, when I go to talk to somebody who's helping me do a conference, they look at my reviews and the reviews aren't there. And I'm not going to get the discounts I would get if they were there. And if I can't get the discounts because they don't think I can fill a lot of seats, I can't pass a discount on to people because I'm not getting the discount. So I'm not going to pay for reviews. I'm not going to ask my family and friends for reviews. And there are many other authors like me. And I really wish that if you really like a book, if it's really helped you, please give it a good review. It's not, you don't even have to say a whole bunch of things about it. Just say one or two things. I wish you guys would just pump this up a little bit. Thank you very much. And speaking of getting back out there, one of the things that I talk about in getting back out there is that it's not all clear sailing. I say in getting back out there, the cliche love means never having to say you're sorry is it overused cliche from a very sappy 70s movie. Yes, I know. But it's true in a way. If you are in a healthy, good, compatible relationship, you don't apologize a lot of the time. You don't have to apologize. There's no need to apologize. You're both being very careful with each other's feelings and not to the point of codependency or enmeshment or anything like that. And one of the things you have to do when you go to getting back out there is you have to read about the early relationship. You have to read about what's functional and what is not functional. You will have many problems in life. Life is difficult. Life happens. Shit happens. And you absolutely have to be on the same side. My ex-husband and I were both from the street. So when we had to evict somebody, we didn't go through landlord-tenant court. We We kicked down doors. That's what we did. When somebody stole our kids' toys out of the yard, we didn't go over and say, please, please give us the toys back. We kicked down the doors. That's what we did. That We solved those problems the same way. But when we were in the house, we were at each other's throats because we didn't solve domestic issues the same way. And he didn't really care about solving anything. He just wanted to criticize me, criticize me, criticize me, keep me down and do whatever the hell he wanted to with the excuse that I wasn't a good wife and mother anyway. So in getting back out there, when I say that the phrase 
Love means ha never having to say you're sorry. It's just not that far fetched. You're not fighting all the time. You're not doing things to upset the other person. And you don't have to say you're sorry. And when I talk about good relationships don't need work, what I mean is there are certain things that should not need work. You should not have to work at not calling someone names. You shouldn't have to work at trusting someone. Trust is there. It's earned over the course of so many months or so many years before you make a serious commitment to each other, you figure out, can I trust this person or not? And it doesn't mean snatching their phone out of their hand and go, let me see who you're talking to. If you're doing that, if you don't trust this other person or you have trust issues and you cannot get them under control, get the hell out of the relationship and either work on your trust issues or work on finding somebody that you can trust. I've said in other podcasts, you can have your passwords to each other's phones. Michael and I had each other's passwords to each other's computer. There was absolutely nothing on there, but we knew that the other person had it. And if you have a good functional relationship and you're both trustworthy, there should be no issue with you having each other's passwords. If it's a big deal, oh no, you can't have my password, then there's a problem with that. But there are many things in getting back out there that you really need to read about in order to figure out what kind of relationship you want next. And also what went wrong in this relationship. And also in the Facebook group, there was a guy who was talking about he's letting his ex stay in the house and they have kids together. And he's letting her stay in the house because when he, when he says that she needs to leave, he says, she says, I'm going to take the kids out of state and you'll never see them again. You can't do that. If somebody is threatening you with that, you go to a lawyer, you get a restraining order. The court that has jurisdiction over your children is where you live. If you move to another state, you have to establish residency there and it's called domicile. You have to establish it and it takes, in most states, can take six months to a year. So for that six months, your home state has jurisdiction over those children and can order them back and will order them back. Judges don't like that. Judges don't like when you move out of state without permission from the other person. If you're letting somebody threaten you with stuff that they can't even do legally and you need to get to a lawyer, make it stop or else you're just allowing it to happen. There's something in it for you. And I always tell people when you're doing the dysfunctional dance and you're allowing it to go on, you have to stop and either make it stop or you have to figure out what's in it for you. Why are you continuing to engage in this? Now, at the end of getting past your breakup, I talk about real love and then getting back out there picks up on the real love concept. What I want you to do is I want you to think back on the relationship inventory. If you don't know if it's time for the relationship inventory, in the new workbook, version three, there is a list of how do you know if you're ready for the relationship inventory? This is how you know. These are the steps that you should be taking before you get to relationship inventory. And then you use your relationship inventory to start your standards and compatibility inventory from getting back out there. And I want you to start thinking about being in this next relationship. Think about being in your next relationship. And yes, I know it's an imaginary relationship at this point. Take a step back and early in the relationship and think about what kind of partner you need. We've talked about the 3 a.m. person. We've talked about the fact that some people say relationships take work. At three o'clock in the morning, that person should not take work. And that's what I'm talking about. You need a person at three o'clock in the morning when the roof is leaking, the baby's crying, the dog wants to go out, but it's afraid of the thunderstorm. You need somebody who's going to spring into action, either listen to you or to give you directions over who's going to do what. You don't want somebody who's going to bark commands. You want somebody who'll say, honey, do this, I'll do that. You do this, I'll do that. In a very non-confrontational way, not like a drill sergeant way. And there are many, many opportunities that you should have early in your relationship to figure out, is this person going to do that? Or are they going to go blame me? I didn't want the dog. You told, I called you to call somebody about the roof. Why is the power out? Or is somebody going to whine? Oh my God, I can't take this. I can't take this. Oh my God, the roof is leaking. The dog wants to go out. The baby's crying. I don't know what to do. Remember in podcast 54, I talked to the guy that was so nervous. He was so nervous. If a guy is too nervous to ask you about you, he's not going to be springing into action three o'clock in the morning when the roof is leaking. Okay, let's get this really, really straight. And a guy came on the Facebook group in that whole thread, which had a million comments and said, if I only dated women 
who didn't talk just about themselves, I wouldn't go on any dates. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If a lady is doing nothing but talking about herself, she's not the person for you. And if you're with these unhealthy people, that says you're unhealthy too. So you need to figure out that you need to be with somebody who's going to ask questions about you. Healthy people ask questions about you. If a man or a woman, or I don't care who it is, a Martian comes and has a date with you and, or a telephone conversation with you and doesn't ask about you, that person is not healthy. So if they're nervous, they're not going to be figuring out how to deal with the leaky roof at three o'clock in the morning. So that's another reason why you don't want, I'm so nervous on the first phone call because at three o'clock in the morning, they're going to be absolutely useless. So I'm so nervous is not going to be your three o'clock in the morning person. I can guarantee it. That's why you have to get away from these toddler excuses. You cannot keep excusing people who are incapable of being an adult. You can't excuse them because you need them at three o'clock in the morning. And like I said, there's a domestic scene. And I understand that not everybody's doing a domestic scene. But whatever situation in life, is going to hit you like that one, whether you want to sail the ocean blue, whether you want to go into business for yourself, whatever you want. Even if you're independently wealthy and you just want to lay on the beach, whatever it is, you're laying on the beach, the hurricane comes. You want somebody who says, hon, pick up the blanket and let's head for shelter. You don't want somebody to say, oh, I didn't know there was going to be a hurricane. What are we supposed to do in a hurricane? I don't know. I'm so nervous. If you're too nervous to ask somebody about themselves, You're not going to know what the hell to do in a hurricane. Trust me on this one. No matter what the situation is in life, no matter what kind of life you're going to live, you are going to have that three o'clock in the morning scenario where absolutely everything goes wrong and you have to spring into action. You have to have a partner who can spring into action. Action is what is needed and it's needed now. It's not needed for when he gets over being nervous. It's going to happen no matter what, no matter what you try to do, No matter what continent you're on, no matter what place you're on, no matter what city you're on, whatever, it's going to happen. So if a person is too nervous or awkward to ask you a question about you, they're not going to be performing at three o'clock in the morning. So let's go back to your imaginary relationship. You're in this new relationship and now you have to step back and you have to get over the infatuation. You have to get over the pretty eyes. You have to get over the warm smile. You have to get over the little cuddling. You have to get over the texting and all this other stuff and you have to take a step back and you have to think. I get what I put up with. So what are you putting up with in the early stages? And if you go to getting back out there, you will read several different stories about people who should have thought things through. They had the signs, they had the red flags early in the relationship. And they just kept going. So you have to think about these things. There was a guy in Getting Back Out There who talked about dating this woman and being real happy with her. He went to a college reunion. He introduced her to his best friend in college who happened to be a woman. And on the way home, his new girlfriend was having a complete and utter fit. And she was jealous and completely crazy. And he's like, I just, I never would have seen the side of her if I hadn't gone to that college reunion. And another woman said she moved in with a boyfriend. All of a sudden, he hated all the furniture. He'd been over there before. He never hated the furniture before. Sometimes things like this can be resolved in one talk. You know, I said it with Michael and I because he didn't have female friends and I had male friends and we had to talk this out. And if he wanted a girlfriend with no male friends, that would be fine. But I wouldn't be that girlfriend. I wasn't giving up my male friends because it would be a very slippery slope. There were two things that he was very uncomfortable with at the beginning of our relationship, that I had male friends and that I like to go away weekends by myself. And I think that he thought that I was doing something wrong in each of those situations and I wasn't. And I needed to have my male friends and I also needed to be able to go away by myself when I needed time out. I told him, I've never cheated on anybody. I don't want to cheat on you. I don't know where this jealousy is coming from and I can't do this and I'm not going to put up with it. Either you trust me or you don't. And if he said, I'm not going to be okay with you having male friends or I'm not going to be okay with you going away by yourself, I would have been like, okay, then I'm not the girlfriend for you. And we talked it out. I understood his sensitivity to it. I really did. I understood that somebody else had cheated on him. 
but I hadn't cheated on anybody and I didn't want to be penalized for the sins of someone else. And the other part of it was that I wasn't going to go crazy. I was going to go away by myself maybe once. I think at the beginning of our relationship, I went away like once every three months. And after a while, it was like twice a year or something. Nothing major. I knew that I had to scale it back a bit, but I couldn't give it up completely. I didn't go out with my male friends all the time. And as soon as I left a restaurant or something, I would call him and, and things would be fine. We both had to work on compromise with that. If he couldn't compromise or I couldn't compromise, then it just wasn't going to work. It has to be reasonable. The work that you do has to be reasonable. It was reasonable for me to scale it back a bit. And it was reasonable of him to have to deal with it a bit. You will meet a lot of people along the way who seem nice, who seem like a perfectly good candidate to be your next long-term relationship. You might have met a sweet person. You might have sexual chemistry together. You might have great conversation together. You could have those things and still not have a good relationship. You could absolutely fall apart at the things that are really important to one of or both of you. You could really fall apart at three o'clock in the morning. You could really fall apart at, hey, let me see your phone. You could fall apart at all kinds of junctures, but you have to realize that before you're doing your relationship inventory after that breakup, And you realize there were all these red flags and you just kept going. And I talk about the standards of compatibility list, the you, me list, the standards of communication in the version three of the workbook. So I'm not really crazy the way the editor laid it out in getting back out there the book, but go to the workbook and do the standards of compatibility inventory, do the you, me part of the list and make sure that what you want out of life and what they want out of life is the same thing. Many times in early relationships, you realize you want a house in the country with three little rugrats and a puppy and your ex wants to buy a sailboat and sail around the world. And you're like, uh, no. Many times people don't even talk about this stuff. They don't even ask, what do you want out of life? Where do you see yourself in five years? They're too busy with the sexual chemistry and they don't want to rock the boat and they don't want to upset this person or point out that, gee, maybe we're not compatible. They say, oh, he's so cute. He's so nice. It's so this is so nice. It's so nice to have somebody after a long period of time. Well, you have to step back and figure it out early in the relationship or else you're going to be in a miserable long-term relationship yet again. You have to look at potential trouble specs. You have to check your standards of compatibility list and you have to say, am I rolling back my standards for this person? Am I holding true to the unacceptable, the absolutely unacceptable, and the absolutely must-haves? Am I holding true to that? If you're not, there's something wrong with that. In the Power Affirmation booklet that I just released, I talk about giving yourself credit for being someone who's polite to service people. A healthy person doesn't look down on other people. You say, thank you, you're nice to waiters, you're nice to bellhops, you're nice to valet parking, whoever it is. You don't look down on people. You don't snub people. You don't talk to them like they're a piece of crap decent, healthy person speaks nicely to other people. So if you're a healthy person, you should be nice to service people, wait staff, yada, yada, yada. So when I go through that in the Power Affirmation booklet, I talk about staying cognizant of the things about you that you're good at and that contributes to your good moral compass, that you have a good sense of decency. I want you to do those foundation affirmations. If you don't know what they are, go to the booklet, figure it out, and start doing them. You have to figure out what is good about you so that when you're out dating, you can look at somebody and go, yeah, no, they're not doing that. That's not okay with me. A person with a good moral compass doesn't do that. If they're snotty to waiters or waitresses, they're acting like they're better than everybody, they're barking at the valet or the bellhop, no, I'm not doing that. You have to be able to say, you know what? That's not good for me and I don't want to do it. That's one of the reasons I have you do some of those foundation affirmations because you want to be around like-minded people. You want to be around people that have the same moral compass. The foundation affirmations make a big deal about the moral compass and this is one of the reasons why. You want to be around people that have a similar moral compass and your partner has to be very, very similar. You don't want to romanticize somebody and ignore their moral compass. They're not paying child support. They're out on bail for something. They're this or they're that. When you do your foundation affirmations, 
You have to keep in mind the good stuff about you and you have to affirm that you want to be with like-minded people who are basically decent human beings. And I talked about in getting back out there, I had this client who took his girlfriend everywhere, absolutely freaking everywhere. And all he wanted her to do was say thank you when they parted after a long trip that he had paid for absolutely everything and made all the arrangements. He would say, I love you. I'm going to miss you. And she wouldn't even answer him. And when he finally said something to her, she's like, fine, don't take me anywhere. That's a bratty response. That's a ridiculous response. That's a stupid response. Absolutely horrific that you could take somebody on a trip like that, pay for everything, and they don't even say thank you. And then when you ask them, they give you that attitude. That's who you lose. That's the person you lose, that brat, that moron. That's who you lose. That person doesn't have a sense of basic decency and that's somebody that you should say the hell with, which is exactly what he did. He was a client of mine for a while. Then he took a boot camp with me and then he got healthy and he fell in love with somebody who was basically decent and loving and wonderful. And I never saw him again. (laughs) He's out there happy, checks in with me now and again. And she's with him, his new girlfriend, soon to be his wife. She's with him through thick and thin. And yes, three o'clock in the morning. And she knows how to say Thank you. So you have to stay cognizant of the things that are good about you so that when you start dating and you're with somebody that is not about them, you recognize that and you realize, I don't want to do this. Don't roll back your standards. Don't roll back anything. Even though there are compromises in relationships, they don't all take work. You have to think about how somebody helps with chores if they don't help with chores or what you're going to do about chores. Because life is not walks on the beach. I don't ever remember walking on the beach with Michael, not once, not ever. Neither one of us were beach people. We weren't going walking in the moonlight. We did a Harley ride in the moonlight once and that was absolutely wonderful. But you have to figure out, are we going to be compatible with this issue? Are we going to be able to work out our differences in difficult times? Many times people stay in bad relationships because they think, oh, well, all relationships take work. Or if you really love somebody, you stick with it, you stick at it, you keep going. That's just not what you do. All relationships don't take work. Life is hard. You should be on the same side most of the time and you should work out the little bumps early on. And if you don't walk the hell away, you're going to stay in bad relationships. Don't make excuses. Don't roll things back. Don't put your standards up to a vote. Don't discuss it. Don't have somebody say, oh, well, that's stupid. You have to figure out your standards are reasonable long before you're with somebody else. And it doesn't matter if they think they're stupid, they think they're silly, they're your standards. Don't put them up to a vote and don't discuss them with a new partner that's going to say, oh, well, that's really stupid. It says in getting back out there, Your relationship should be both a springboard to launch your life and a fortress in the storm. It has to be both of those things. It should not be the storm. It should not be something that holds you back from launching your life, that launches the things that you're passionate about. It has to be both a springboard and a fortress. And if it's not, it's not the relationship for you. You have to work together on your couple's inventory and you don't actually have to sit down with the other person and do it. And I talk about getting back out there, how to do that. But you have to figure out what's important to you and then you have to figure out how to form questions so that when you're on dates, you can actually ask people things so that you can gather information for the stuff that's really, really important to you. Long-term success depends on your ability to have things work out and to avoid day-to-day arguments. And this is the part that people get wrong all the time. Arguing all the time is not normal. It's not natural and good relationships don't work that way. In the early days, there are periods of hashing things out. How are we going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with that? I'm this way on that thing. You're this way on that thing. We really need to figure out how to compromise in the middle. What are we going to do? You have to sit down. You have to figure out what kind of couple you're going to be. But you have to figure this out on your own first. What kind of person am I looking for to become a couple with me? Many times people get together, they have a honeymoon period, and it's like, oh, it's so nice. We have a lot of chemistry. 
And then you have a period where reality sets in. And that's where you have to figure out how different are we and can we work out our differences. I told you my husband Michael smoked in the shower and I was appalled, absolutely appalled. When I first went over his house and I was taking a shower the first morning to go to work, I said, why is there an ashtray on the windowsill in the bathroom, which was where the shower was? And he's like, well, I'm smoking in the shower. And I was like, what? What? I'm like, how could you be smoking in the shower? And I said, you know, if we move in together, there's not going to be any smoking in the shower. And I would tell my friends, Michael smokes in the shower. They go, what? And most of my friends smoked at the time. And I would say, Michael smokes in the shower. And I had to say to him, this is not going to happen. This was not a compromise. You cannot smoke in the shower. You cannot smoke in the bathroom. And I talked about the laundry thing. I mean, Michael had a basket of clothes in the downstairs coat closet when he got sick. And I didn't move those clothes for months because I would just tear up every time I saw them. And I would tell him in this house, because I gave my kids a box of soap powder when they were 10 years old. You're 10, double ditches. Now you wash your own clothes. You wash, dry, and put away. And with kids, you have to be on the case a lot. Wash, dry, put away. Come on, keep the line moving, keep the line moving. So when Michael came, he was used to doing his laundry whenever the hell he felt like it. And I used to have to remind him, wash, dry, put away, wash, dry, put away. He didn't get the put away part very good. He would take them out of the dryer and he dumped them on the pool table. I'd be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. So then when the cleaning lady was coming, because that was a compromise, because I wasn't going to clean up after him. That was a compromise was we were going to get a cleaning lady together. I would say the cleaning lady's coming tomorrow. I'm not paying her to fold your clothes off the pool table. I'm not paying her to clean your area in the coffee table in the family room where you've got all kinds of food wrappers and bowls and dishes and all kinds of crap. So clean it up before she gets there. What he used to do with the clothes, he would dump them in the laundry basket and shove it in the closet. They never, ever, ever, ever made it upstairs to his dresser. That's why I wanted them, but they were never going to get up there. It just wasn't worth it to me to make this into a big, hairy deal. The most I got him to do was wash dry. I was never getting him to put away. There shouldn't be shouting. There shouldn't be yelling. There shouldn't be fighting over these stupid things. It can get heated, but there should never be name calling. There should never be threats. There should never be anything like that. You have to work to find the solution for your relationship that works for both of you. The compromise that I had with Michael was not the way I wanted them to be and not the way he wanted them to be. But what was good for the relationship, for the big picture relationship, Sometimes you have to think about the big picture items. You have to think about the stuff that I talk about and getting back out there, the Craig Ferguson questions. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said now? Does this need to be said now by me? We used to ask those questions all the time before I even knew about those questions. Make sure you're not with somebody who gaslights. Make sure you're not with somebody who has a gotcha mentality, who's looking to see what you're going to do wrong. Remember, your relationship should be a springboard to what you want in life that's important to you, your career, your hobbies, your friends, your interests. And I told you, have those things built before you get into a next relationship and don't give them up. Look at your dates. Is this somebody that I can enjoy being with? Do we have things that we're simpatico to? Do we look at life the same way? Do we tackle issues the same way? And if we don't, Are there areas where we can compromise? Because if you can't compromise on certain things, you're not going to make it. And other things you have to say, no, I cannot compromise on this. And we're going to need to figure this out. In both Getting Back Out There and the workbook, I talk about the different dysfunctional patterns of dysfunctional relationships. Go to those places and look at them and figure out what it looks like long before you ever get to dating. Not all relationships are clear sailing, but all relationships don't take a lot of work. Once you work out the early parts, it should be a fortress in a storm and a springboard in which to launch the other parts of your life. You can have many problems in life, but the two you should be on the same side. You should tackle problems together. So please go to Getting Back Out There. Please read these sections that I'm talking about and please go on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, wherever, and please review the book. Please go on the Facebook 
pages. Everything is listed in the resources, gettingpasturebreakup.com, and you will see it says all of the resources. Please go to the resources if you belong to the Facebook group. In the group guidelines, there's a link to resources in about 75 places in the guidelines. Please go there. Please go through all the resources, review, like, subscribe, etc. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, guys. And I look forward to your cards and letters. Please let me know what you think. And hey, let's be careful out there. Talk to you later. This is the Million Talk Podcast. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.